You've got 10 seconds. The countdown going on right now. I'm sorry, I'm not doing it the wrong way. This is Play by Play Cast, the world's number one sports media podcast. Wait, what? Nobody's fact checking it. Just keep going. Here we go. Who the hell is Happy Gilmore? Got all that on camera, right, John? Sure, I did. All right, because the red light was not on. The podcast about play by play broadcasters for play by play broadcasters, hosted by a play by play broadcaster. Oh, you can stick me in some kind of Italian boat because that one is Gondola. Now, from New York. Really? All the big ones are from New York. Your host, Joe Godet. It's still Joel. Yeah, he will not be able to see very well, Cotton. Here we go. Hey, it's Friday morning, which means it's another time for Play by Play Cast. Thanks, as always, for the subscribe, the stream, the download, however you have found this here podcast. My name is Joel Godet. It is Play by Play Cast, the podcast about play by play broadcasters for play by play broadcasters, hosted by one, a professional development podcast that dives into the tips, tricks, experience, stories, process, and preparation of some of the biggest and best play by play announcers in the business on social media at PXPCast or at Joel Godet. Email me, J-G-O-D-E-T-T at B-S-U dot E-D-U. Our guest today, since 1990, has been on the broadcast team, and for the overwhelming majority of the time, he has been the voice of the team with the Des Moines Iowa Cubs. Dean Ellis, who cut back his schedule a couple of years ago, uh, but has been a staple of the American Association uh, at first, and then the Pacific Coast League for the better part of the last 30 years. Uh, we'll get to Dean here in a second, but minor league baseball guest this week, baseball guest next week, a lot of baseball. It's baseball season, so for those of you in the minors, maybe listening to this on a bus right now, you're in the thick of you know your job. It's this is what you guys all live for. When you're on the college side, this is the downtime of year, and. I don't know what to do with myself sometimes when we get to this time of year. I mean, th- that's how this podcast was born. Out of boredom, because I, I had no games to call. I started a podcast three years ago. This past weekend was the first weekend in which I had no games to broadcast. I don't want to say that definitively, because maybe there was another one. But certainly I had no games to broadcast or prep for. First time. Since August of last year. Like, long run there. But I didn't plan it out ahead of time. Like, like life goes on. You just, yada, 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 you go day by day. And I, I get to last weekend, and I suddenly had nothing to do. Like, I'm not going to go into work. I, I, I could. I'd be the only one there. Um, and I had no games to call. So, uh, I, okay. I literally, on Saturday morning last week... Having just realized I had made no plans for my newfound freedom, uh, I woke up and went to the gym on Saturday morning, and then I got home and I binge-watched The Americans. I plopped down on my sofa and did not move until about 2 in the morning, (laughs) at which point I uh, went to bed and woke up and played opening day for my slow-pitch softball league, and... um, Came home and watched watched more of the Americans. I like like we always say it's it'll be nice to have a day off or a weekend off, and then we get one. And I have no earthly idea what to do with it. I just watched Amazon Prime. Like wh- got through three whole seasons of a very good television show, but that mere fact is both impressive, embarrassing. And just downright amazing. That's how I spent my first weekend with nothing to do. This weekend, I do have something to do. Saturday night, tomorrow night, if you're listening to this on time, uh, it's the Indiana High School All-Star Game. Ball State's got a couple uh, kids in that, a guy and a girl. Uh, So I'll go shoot some video of them. So that takes care of Saturday night. I got softball on Sunday. Um, No, I don't. Ooh, I have nothing to do on Sunday. I'll have to make some plans. I might go on a hike somewhere. We'll see. I've got... It's like I feel like I feel like the character in uh, in Pitch Perfect, um, Bumper, when when he gets signed to his record label. It's like I'm I'm a, I'm gonna go get a tattoo. I'm gonna I'm I i do not know I, I don't know. I forget, I forget what what else the rest of that line is. I'm not gonna get a tattoo, Mom and Dad. Uh, it's just, I just I don't know what to do. Um, we'll think of something. Anyway, 
Let's get to Dean Ellis. Uh, before we start with Dean, if you are new to the podcast or you did not get a chance to listen to last week's episode, uh, Kevin Harlan was our guest from Westwood One and TNT and CBS. Uh, hands down, one of my favorite episodes, favorite guests uh, of all time. So if you get the opportunity and you've got a half an hour, uh, do click back through last week and listen to that one. Uh, you will not be sorry about that at all. Uh, our conversation with Dean Ellis, though, because he's been doing this for a very long time. Uh, he's turning 66 in June. I started with, and he's been in the same place since 1990. I started with how he keeps this fresh and what keeps him coming back to it, energized to um, bring baseball to Des Moines and, you know, with the internet to the world, but uh, to the, the Des Moines Cubs fans on a day in and day out basis for 30 years. Uh, he is one of the most respected voices in AAA, and this week he is our guest on PXP Cast. I think it all goes back to your childhood and growing up and just loving sports in general, but in particular baseball and, you know, playing the game and just loving to get out there, loving to get outside and, and play catch and hit the ball and, you know, compete. And you just have that childhood love for the game. And you, like a lot of kids, you're thinking, oh, boy, I want to be a ball player when I grow up and get to the big leagues. And, you know, some like for me, the guys uh, I would see growing up, the Mickey Mantle and uh, Bill Freehand and, and different players like that, thinking, yeah, I want to do that one day. And then, I'll, you know, as you get older into the teenage years, you start to realize that, well, that's probably not going to happen. So you're looking at what what else could I do to get involved in in sports in general and baseball in particular. And I always thought broadcasting was a was a good way to do it. And I think it's just the the love of the game that uh, keeps you going. And you know, there's tough travel in our league, and I've got a family and a lot of a lot of events I've had to miss family wise. But it's just that uh, passion you have and the love of baseball that keeps you going from day to day. And and why you uh, show up, show up, and of course the the term you hear a lot in baseball, particularly the minor leagues, is grinding it out. And as you get going in the season, year after year, you're you're definitely trying to grind out uh, some of the tougher days that you you run into. You don't get used to the old uh, 4 a.m. flight out of the PCL. Yes, yeah, we, uh, you know, typically you, they always want the first flight just in case there's some type of a problem with uh, you know a flight. Uh, canceled or delayed or whatnot that that there's some alternatives if you leave at noon you know theoretically you might get to the place at three or four o'clock in time to go to the ballpark and go to the game but uh, many a time as we know you know anybody in traveling these days there's always a complication so uh, the first flight out is the one you have to get that's the league rule so you might play a night game and be up the next morning at uh, 3 34 o'clock to get to the airport and get on a flight at at six o'clock, to whether whether you're heading back home or your next uh, destination, and of course for the players, uh, it's the, I think it's even tougher for them. They've got to go out and physically compete after maybe not having uh, very little sleep or any at all. In some cases, with with uh, you know a three or four a.m. wake up call, and and again you get back to that term of kind of grinding it out and and just uh, learning to adapt and and uh, yeah it it. Uh, it's a tough one, but again, you fall back and you just the same for the players. They love what they're doing and the chance to their career basically playing a game and hopefully get to the big leagues and, and to make a good living up there. But uh, that's what it comes back to is that, that love of the game that everybody seems to have. I feel like you've been doing this too long for the answer to, to, to not be affirmative. Uh, have you ever had uh, those complications on flights and issues? Oh, yeah, there's all kinds of stories of, of weather delays and canceled flights. And I can remember one, and we uh, made it to Minneapolis, but our connecting flight back to Des Moines, which was always funny because you, many a time you'd fly somewhere and you'd fly over Des Moines to land in Minneapolis or Chicago to, and take, you know, that hour flight back home to, to get there. But we didn't have a flight, so we were renting cars. Uh, we were down in New Orleans when Katrina hit. And, of course, they canceled the games, and we had to get out of town, couldn't get a flight. And, fortunately, we were able to get a bus, so we had to, to bus back to Des Moines. And there's almost every year something comes up. And I remember one year we we made it, but none of the equipment made it. And uh, they thought they were going to have to cancel the game. But our, our general manager, we went out to a sporting goods store and, and bought some gloves and, 
you know, which didn't work out too well. But uh, we had to, you know, you have to make adaptations for sure to try to try to get the games in. And we're using aluminum bats today because that's all we could find. Uh, <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, what was being in New Orleans around the time of Katrina like? Was that immediate? The immediate aftermath of the storm? The immediate uh, before the storm? Was it during it? Yeah, it was. No, it was. It was uh, before the storm, and and uh, again, I just felt we were fortunate to get out of town to be able to get that bus, and and of course, even once you have a bus, it was difficult traveling. With uh, you heard the reports of highways backed up and people lined up on these highways couldn't couldn't move, and we had some slow traffic, but overall, we made it out of town okay. But it was just before the storm hit, and and we sure didn't want to be. Uh, trapped there because you'd see all the pictures and the flooding and the devastation that happened but uh, we got out of town just as it was happening and and uh, and it was yeah that was one of the more memorable uh, uh, travel endeavors that we had through the years you've obviously been in uh, in two different leagues since you've been in Des Moines um, what trip do you miss most that you no longer get from the American Association uh, that's a good question. I like that because uh, the American Association. I enjoyed going to Buffalo, even though it was a longer flight. But it was it's uh, you know a nice city, uh, great ballpark, good people there. Uh, so I, I always miss going to Buffalo. But even uh, Indianapolis, especially with their new ballpark, yeah. uh, we used to and Bush Stadium, the old one, was a pretty good place to broadcast the game, and they had good crowds. So that was a good trip, and even more so with with their Victory Stadium they have now. We had it, I think maybe a couple of years in our league before they, you know, broke up the association. So Indianapolis was good. And even Louisville, I liked their old ballpark with, you know, short porch and right field and the artificial surface. And they had, uh, you had to climb stairs to get to the broadcast booth, which doesn't happen too often anymore, but uh, it was, it was a good stop too, because again, they had good crowds and good support. And at that time, I think they were, they were the Cardinal affiliates. It was fun. Kind of that Cub Cardinal rivalry. Those games are always fun. The, uh, the old Bush Stadium in Indianapolis is uh, it's an apartment complex now too. By the way, uh, the field is yeah, still no, there. I've it's like a wiffle ball yes, field. I've, yeah. yeah, exactly. I've read articles on that. That's interesting. And Oklahoma City, of course, still in the league. But I think there, the old ballpark we used to go there. All Sports Stadium is is like a racetrack, a go kart racetrack or something, I believe, or maybe part of it's a parking lot. But uh, yeah, things things have sure, sure changed. There were some. Some uh, tough ballparks in, in the old days, but overall, uh, you know, AAA is, is uh, comparable. At least the ballparks are really nice uh, compared to what they were uh, in the old days. And even the, some of the hotels that we used to go to were, you know, a little a little down at times. <laughs> but uh, that, that's that been upgraded, too, and usually we stay at pretty nice, nice places now. I want to get into a little bit of the, the philosophy you have on, on what you do. And... Uh, I want to start really broad picture and just ask you what makes a good baseball game on the radio to you beyond like the, the basics of time score and, you know, is it a ball? Is, is it a strike? What separates a really quality listen from just something that's out there? I think you've got to almost have a conversation with uh, almost think, well, one person is listening or, or whether it's one or a hundred or thousands, but it's almost a one-on-one -on -one where you're talking with somebody about the game and, and uh, you know, describing the game, but try to inflect some things about uh, the ballpark or the city or baseball in general, some history of the other team or history of the players and, and add some information along with the, uh, you know, the score is most critical in what's going on. You can't lose track of that. That's definitely number one. But I just think you have to make it as interesting as possible. And as you know, Joel, in any baseball season, big leagues or, or minor leagues, you're going to have those games or you're, you're losing 10 to 2. Or even if you're ahead 10 to 2, you have to come up with some things to, to keep it interesting. And, and I think that's a big part of it. And I've always approached it where – you know, here in the Midwest, we're we're uh, competing against the the big leagues. We've got, you know, fans love the Cubs, and Pat Hughes is like one of the best in the game, if not the best. And and I always uh, approached it as, you know, that I'm for listenership. I'm competing with the uh, the Cubs. They can pick up the Cardinals here, the Royals, uh, the Twins fans that are in this area. So I always thought, you know what, I've got to do my best to make it sound like a a major league broadcast. And 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 again, part of that is just uh, passing along some information that they might not 
get if they're sitting at the ballpark and, and uh, watching the game and maybe listening and uh, a little more so than the play-by-play. But, of course, again, play-by-play and what's, what's going on in the field is very important. Yeah, obviously, been doing this a long time. What, is, what has changed in terms of how people call games now? Like, I, I feel like this is like that. I don't want to make, make this out to be like old man yells at clouds moment. Um, or like get off my lawn, but like what 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 is different about the the younger broadcasters, and I'll throw myself into that 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 mix about the way that we approach the game, um, and and broadcasting the game that has evolved over time, uh, for better and and potentially you know things that 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 you wish people still did a, a different way. Uh, social media has become uh, more important as it is in everything, but even before that. Uh, Early on, we'd have some information on our team and the opposing teams and hitting streaks and, and some of the basic facts on the team. But now there's just so much more knowledge uh, and more information that you have to prep on and try to integrate it into the broadcast, but not overdo it. I think I think we can get carried away, a tendency to get carried away with some of the statistics and especially getting into some of the new terminology with you know exit velocity and and things like that are, are interesting, but you have to kind of uh, use it to sparingly. And again, think that a, most of the people listening, I don't know that they're, they're, there's a few that are really knowledgeable baseball fans, but for the most part, they're just the casual baseball fan interested in the, the team or a certain player. And so I think the, I guess the, the bottom line with that question is there's just so much more information. Uh, social media has become important. And again, I think you have to integrate that into the broadcast, but not try to overdo it. And, and it all goes back to focusing on, on what's happening out in front of you in the diamond. And, and again, that goes back to something I said about, you know, in, uh, going back many years where we didn't have as much, much information, you would talk more about uh, maybe the, the city, the ballpark, uh, some of the fans at the game, just uh, the weather conditions. Uh, I'm, I'm a big one that likes the, uh, and, of course, this comes into play now with all the shifts going on, but I, I was always big into defensive alignments and even trying to notice where outfielders or infielders were shifting depending on the, the hitter, the pitch count, uh, the pitcher, and, and just little things like that that, that again, the, uh, the casual fan, if they happen to be in the ballpark and, and uh, listening to the game while they're watching the game, things that they can also pick up on. And, and I always – Thought too about little kids that you know just just basic stuff about you know chasing pitches out of the zone or whatnot, but anything you could do to for some eight or ten or twelve year old listening to the broadcast that might learn something and go out to his little league or high school game and, and adapt and use that that would help him. That that was also good too. That's got to have uh, evolved your prep too, because information is so readily available now. And that's probably one of the knocks on young guys coming up is like, well, they don't talk to enough people. They just, you know, you, you read articles on the internet and you read stats and you call a game. Um, what, like, what did you have to do before you could go into the stats portal and easily pull up what this guy is hitting with runners on base on a Tuesday when it doesn't rain? Um, like, how, how did you prepare differently, and how has that helped, um, like, keep you on top of your game? Uh, as you know, you, you move forward in your career at this point. Yeah, there's definitely more knowledge out there with the internet, which is wonderful. I think I've I've learned more about, especially more so the opposing team, where you just don't know these guys and and they're in for three four games, and so you can do some searching in the internet and find some interesting things out. And and of course now they used to be they'd have in the media guy they'd have information like that, but a lot of teams have done away with with the media guys. But the internet has helped there. But in the old days, I think it, there was. At least for me, there was more communication with, with the uh, players and uh, talking to them more about yesterday's game or why they do this or why they, their hitting stance is that way and, and defensively why they're doing some things or pitching-wise, you know, about, about the pitches they throw and what they threw in that situation. You can you did more of that than you do now just because you, you do have to put some time in, uh, in my opinion, on the Internet and just delving into the – the daily stats and the, the information that each team sends out prior to the game, you have to spend more time delving into that because there is some good information there, but you might have to do some digging. So it's still a combination, but I think more so 20, 30 years ago, you would talk more and get more information out of the players and the coaches were, 
you know, probably more so the coaches and the manager, depending on your relationship with, with your staff, uh, you get a lot of information out of them about uh, not just in the moves they made, but why this player does that or where he needs to improve and, and to go from there. So it's still a combination of doing those things. But again, I think with uh, with all the information we have on the internet and, and the team notes that come out every day, there's probably more time spent on that than there was many years ago. I've read you do at least three hours of homework for each broadcast. Um, what's that consist of? Uh, again, this day and age, a lot of it is involved with uh, doing some searches on the internet or maybe getting uh, just keeping your ears open and hearing something about a player and, and, and trying to investigate that. Uh, I still like to follow you know, each major league team even if it's in a small way, just to know what's going on in Major League Baseball. Because, again, I think a lot of the, the people listening are baseball fans in general and probably more so Major League fans than minor league fans. Their interest in the, the minor leagues is probably more on individuals and guys coming up, especially if you're a Chicago Cubs fan. You're wondering, you know, who's going to be the next big starting pitcher or uh, or the next big prospect uh, going back to the Baez and, and Bryant and Schwarber, all the guys we've had in recent seasons, all the interest in them. So they're they're listening because they're Chicago Cubs fans and they want to know about individuals. So you have to, uh, you know, do do some homework there on on different uh, individuals. But yeah, you're you're probably right. It might be just because I'm a baseball fan, and in many ways, just do things that I typically do because I'm a fan of the game. But following baseball in general, and again, doing some work on the internet, and then. Uh, you know, batting practice, It's you talk to the players or during BP or maybe when the, the pitchers are doing their side work and find out some little things. But sometimes you just uh, see things that they're doing and working on that, that you can kind of integrate into the, the broadcast where, man, so-and-so today and it was really concentrating on going the other way and in batting practice, not thinking about home runs and hit the ball a lot the other way to right field. And then in the game, he gets two hits over there and you can – you can combine that in. So in many cases, it's not only maybe talking to the players, but more so just keeping your eyes and ears open and some things you might see uh, during uh, BP and some of the sessions they have before each game. I was going to say, big big batting practice, stand around the cage kind of guy? Yeah, I do like that. That's a good time to to meet the players. Uh, I've cut back. I don't travel as much as I used to. The, uh, that was also a good way to kind of get to know the players, and more so not so much in the baseball context, but also they're just the, the personal guys, and you'd hear about, you know, Al, you know, I, I can't really afford to have my wife out here for the season. She's teaching school back home, or, you know, just their personal story was always interesting for me, all the sacrifices they have to make to try to get to the big leagues. And, and uh, so that was that was always nice. The travel, I think, was you know, the, the negative side were the early wake-up calls and some of the long flights and layovers and delays and whatnot. But the positive was you really could get closer to the players and get to know them a little better. And But uh, for me, batting practice is a nice time just to, you know, not a lot, but uh, not overdo it. I think you can kind of overdo it when you're, you're with the players there. But, but again, just to ask a question or two and observe some things and uh, talk to them uh, around the batting cage. That's more relaxed atmosphere and and uh, kind of a casual time. Tell me a little bit about developing those relationships and how you, everyone knows what our job is and and why we're there for the most part, but how how you um, create that bond where there's a a, a trust in you and you can get to know a person, not just for, hey, Tom, I'm asking this question for information because I want to use it on the air, but... I'm asking this question because I'm generally interested in, in who you are, and I want to create that friendship, for lack of a better word, which then leads to inherently a better broadcast, and particularly at the AAA level where you get so many different personalities and some guys are angry because they've been sent down, and um, you know, you, you get a, there's a much different blend of personality types as opposed to if you're working with the very much more doe-eyed kind of players in, in low A or high A. Yeah, definitely the case, and it's more difficult. I've always been envious, you know, in the big leagues. You have the, you're with one team, and and you just get to know the players because in some cases they're there not just four or five years, but eight, ten years, and and just the, there can be a friendship developed there by 
by that longevity factor. But as you said, and it's even more so in the last few years where guys just aren't in AAA as much as they used to be, where they might spend one or two years here or typically a, a full season at least in AAA before they got the call to the big leagues. But now they're shuffling guys back and forth, so it's even more difficult. But I think for me, part of part of what's helped me is, uh, you know, I, I, I'm semi-retired now, but I used to work for the team year-round to do sales in the off season. And I think that helped where you just learn to be personable and how to communicate with people and probably number one in sales and maybe number one in the broadcast business is just being a good listener and talking to the guys about, you know, hey, where are you from? And you find out they're home and then you ask them a couple of questions and, and they get going. And then I think players are, are – most of them are happy to talk about the non-baseball subjects and, and their family and how they grew up and how they fell in love with the game and things like that. So it's just a matter of – just be yourself. You know, I think that's part of my upbringing too, was to be friendly and sociable and work with people and, and uh, just kind of be yourself and, and talk to them. Not so much as a broadcaster doing an interview, but just as uh, a per, well, you know, one person talking with another and, and just trying to find out a little bit about them. Do you have a way to catalog that per se? Like, not that you would be writing it down as they're telling it to you, but how you make sure that it doesn't all run together or away from your mind uh, after you have those types of conversations? You know, not really. There, there probably should be a way to do that. I have a little book or something just to take a couple of notes. If something really important was involved that, that related to I thought would relate to the broadcast, I would do that. But, you know, hopefully your recall is good enough that at least the, the basic fact that you know that uh, so-and-so and his wife are expecting and she's back home or whatnot, things like that, or you know, he's got three brothers back home that he says are better than him. Or I still remember that with uh, Jose Molina was a catcher one year and talking to him about Benji, his older brother, and how good Benji was. He said, yeah, uh, Benji and I, we're pretty good. We're doing okay. But I'll, I'll tell you, we got another little brother, Yadier, who's going to be better than the both of us. And, you know, I mentioned that on, on the, the broadcast. And, of course, uh, here we are. 20, 25 years later, where Yadier was might be a Hall of Famer, and, and Benji and Jose had good careers, but uh, Jose hit that one on the nose. So I again, to answer your question, I don't really have a, a system to keep track of that, but hopefully your mind is sharp enough to remember at least uh, the most important stuff. And and uh, you know sometimes you have you just go back and ask the players about. It. They'll mention a problem or something going on at home, and you just have to re- recall that and try to bring it up with them or, you know, family coming to town. And sometimes you meet the dads and find out a little more, dads or moms find out a little more about the players too. Where did your style come from? Uh, like I, I, People have said you, you've got a very calm demeanor, understated style on the air. How did you develop that kind of even keel? Um, you know, I'm sitting in the living room just kind of, chilling with you style if that makes sense yeah I, I think part of it is the the broadcaster i listened to i didn't really think about this till years later but the broadcaster i listened to growing up uh herb carneal i'm from montana and the games we had on on the radio were with the minnesota twins so it was herb carneal and then halsey hall was was uh the sidekick but herb did the play-by-play and he had a real just factual play-by-play of what's going on uh, and, you know, real calm. You get excited at the right time. But, but basically just uh, uh, you can, as a listener, would, would relax and enjoy. You knew what was going on. And, and he and Her- Halsey were just wonderful partners, just bantering back and forth about baseball or, like I said earlier, a game gets out of hand. They might be talking about Halsey loved to smoke cigars, so they'd be talking about Halsey and cigars or uh, someplace they ate at or, or things uh, away from baseball. But Herb was just... Uh, to me, just very smooth and, and just a nice way to listen to the game and not overhyping anything. And and uh, so that was part of it. And I, again, part of it is you just have to be yourself, your personality. That I know some broadcasters are just more hyper, I guess, would be the word I would use compared with me. And, and so they get a little more fired up about some plays than, than maybe I, what I would. But uh, I think you have to be yourself and, and then, uh, you know, probably listen to as many – broadcasters as you can and, and uh, adapt your own style. I think also an influence for me was initially in radio. I started out as a disc jockey and 
and I kind of got into it, uh, radio business for the love of music and, and the love of, of sports. But initially, this jockey, before they let me do some high school basketball and, and football games, and eventually I got into minor league baseball. But uh, I think the, the the being a DJ also kind of set my style and my tempo and and the delivery that I have that that helped too. So it I can't say it's any one thing, but just that combination of factors where where you become the the broadcaster you are and you have your own style and and uh, you know different things appeal to different listeners and I think that's the case with uh, baseball broadcasters too. Was a lot of that second nature or did you do a lot of active listening in terms of trying to pick things away or, or was it just that osmosis? I think it was more the osmosis. I would I would listen probably more so the again being here in the Midwest and and uh, after our games would end or if we had a day game the uh, probably the the game I'd listen to on the radio before the days of the internet where you can pick up any game now uh, would be the Chicago Cubs, you know, going back to whether it's TV or radio, but uh, listening to uh, Harry Carey and, and not only his play by play, but also just how he and Stone, Steve Stone were such a great team together and the relationship they had and, you know, Chip Carey with the Cubs and Tom Brenneman and the guys that were very good play by play guys. And of course, the last, 25 years almost now just Pat Hughes and listening to him and and he's that same kind of kind of guy for me at least it's just an easy listen he, he for the most part is casual very factual and does a great job for years with with uh, working with Juan Santo and of course now with uh, Ronnie Coomer they're a real good team so I I can't say I was doing it to try to to uh, learn some new things but just uh, again as a baseball fan and I think uh as you say, osmosis or subconsciously, you pick up some things that, that you hear uh, from other people and, and integrate it into the person that you are and helps with your uh, style. Well, and I was going to say, it's kind of like the, it's, it's like the anti-Harry Carey a little bit in some respects. Yeah, 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 of course, Harry was. But again, if you go way back, uh, if, you know, even before my time, if you listen to old tapes of Harry when it was with the Cardinals, man, he was... Uh, uh, like uh, some of the best play-by-play I've ever heard is is Harry. He was right on top of things as far as the play-by-play and very knowledgeable about the game and and uh, just his voice was so much better when he was young and and going with the Cardinals that it's uh, it's quite a difference. And later, you know, TV days with the Cubs was more he was the part of the show and the things he would say and way he would describe it. Maybe miss a play here or there or get behind, but uh, that was all part of uh, you know why fans loved him so much. You are uh, of the, the, the company, and I'm, I'm in this group as well, that, that uh, I know I've read you, you've said you don't need a home run call. That's not something that you'd ever really thought about. Uh, I know you'd tried a couple things that didn't necessarily work, but then you, you wound up with Bye Bye Baseball. Uh, how did that come to be, and, and why did that wind up working? Well, my first, uh, well, I did some games in rookie ball in uh, Helena, uh, with the Pioneer League team, and I, I didn't really have a home run call then, but then when I got real serious about it and decided to make a career change, and because uh, I worked for the radio station and, and uh, did sales and eventually a general manager, but uh, my true love again was baseball, and I thought, you know what, if I don't, this was going back to uh, the mid mid to late 80s, thought, you know, I've got to get into baseball, and, and like all broadcasters, you're always thinking I want to get to the big leagues, so uh, I started looking for jobs in minor league baseball, and my first full-time minor league job was in Midland. With at that time, it was the Angels, the Midland Angels in the Texas League Double A. And I just thought, you know what, I should I should come up with a home run call. And so I had uh, the home run call was to tie it in with the Angels was fly away to home run heaven. And uh, and then when I came here to Des Moines after a couple of years in Midland. I didn't really have one, and I, I guess I don't really recall how I came up with uh, Bye Bye Baseball. I, I think I think somebody had a similar call in the big leagues, and I tried to adapt it where it's – and I don't recall who that was or when that was, but it was Goodbye Baseball. Maybe if somebody had Goodbye Baseball, and I thought, yeah, that sounds pretty good. So, And with Bye Bye, you can kind of say it a couple of times, Bye Bye, Bye Bye Baseball, and so I decided to go with that. I, I thought having a home run call, I think, is 
is a good idea just to have your try to come up with some terms that that people associate with your broadcast. Wanted to ask you about uh, a couple of guys that you uh, you had the chance to see in your career. If I can take you back um, and just kind of do a like a quick association with some people you've crossed paths with, because that always intrigues me at the minor league level. Um, if I can go back to when you first, I think it was when you first started in Iowa. It might have been before one of your previous stops. Um, what do you remember about Turk Wendell? Uh, Turk was quite the character. What I remember about him is, that all, of course, all his uh, eccentricities where we had supposedly it's the original building. It's a very small little structure. Uh, you know, it's almost like one of these mini homes now, except not even that big, but it's uh, very close to the ballpark. In fact, just outside the, the ballpark, the original uh, building in Des Moines when it was established way back in the 1800s. So they preserved that building, and I remember – Turk uh, saying he wished he could live in that building because he, you know, there was that, and he would show up with uh, the chain around his neck, not a chain, but, uh, you know, the necklace that had uh, bear's teeth on it. They're just these different, and he talked about some of the hunting expeditions he'd been on or hoped to go on, and, yeah, he was uh, he was quite the character. But, it, but then on the field, he was a good teammate, but also on the field, he was just such a good competitor. He, you could tell he loved the game and going out there and helping his team win. And, and of course, jumping over the line, headed out from the dugout to the pitching mound, he'd kind of take a hop skip over the mound and brushing his teeth between innings and chewing on licorice. And, uh, yeah, he was one of the more, uh, uh, I guess, eccentric would be the, the word, but more interesting people we've had here as far as personality. There's been so many. You know, Rod Beck was such a nice guy when he was here, uh, you know, trying to get back to the big leagues. And he even lived in, in a motor home. He parked it out by where the grounds crew is and, and lived out there. And fans were welcome to stop in and, and uh, talk to him after a night game or have a beer or two. And, boy, he was he was a memorable guy. And, and uh, there's there so many. You know, Kerry Wood was another one that, he played here on and off so many years. He was here, you know, coming up when he was 19 and 20 as a, a phenom on his way to Chicago. But then he'd come back probably four other times, four other seasons on rehab. But he was always such a nice guy and easy to talk to. And and it was fun to watch him, too, as uh, from a 19, 20-year-old who was a little on the shy side and didn't say too much to become more of a veteran pitcher and a leader, I think, for the Chicago Cubs to – see that growth in him as, as a person where you come back on rehab and was always cordial and, and happy to see and not only myself but other people that he, he knew from when he played here as a, as a young guy in Des Moines. He always seemed to appreciate the fans coming out to support him too. Yeah, that was uh, that was one of the things I was going to ask was about uh, Rod Beck's uh, RV trailer. Uh, like, did you ever get a chance to hang out there when he was in town? I, You know, I think I went out there once, but again, it was he, he enjoyed living out there, and he, he had a fun time. He made the best of the situation. As, <laughs> you know, as you said, guys sometimes come down to the to the minor leagues and they don't like it. How soon am I going to get out of here? But he seemed to enjoy it, and he was another guy that's just a great competitor, loved to get out there and pitch, and he, he was only thrown in the mid-'80s to, you know, maybe 87, 88 at times. He, he didn't have much stuff left, but, but, man, he would somehow get people out just with location and the guile that he had out there. and. So he seemed to, to love what he was doing and, and of course, did get back to the, the big leagues uh, for a brief time. But, uh, yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting time. Um, how about Doug Glanville? Do you remember the most intellectual conversation you had with, with Doug Glanville when he was around? Was he, was he still that kind of headsy guy back then? He was, but uh, I guess I kept it more on the, on the baseball side. Uh, what I remember about Doug is he uh, – was a hard worker uh, that he worked a lot at that time. Another one of the more notable characters that I, that I got to know because he fit in with me on the broadcast whenever he came to town was Jimmy Pearsall was the uh, Chicago Cubs outfield instructor. So he was there probably four or five times during the year. But uh, I think Doug was just an excellent student with Pearsall to improve his outfield play. And even, even working with our coaching staff and the manager about becoming a better hitter and, I think he just uh, showed how smart he was by being able to adapt and get better year by year and take his natural talent and, and improve on that to uh, get to the big leagues. And then 
the toughest part is the staying, and he was able to do that. He had a very nice career up there. I want to ask you about one guy that was not on your team, um, but I have to imagine you saw him on an opposing team in 1988 and 1989. We're going to go way back. Uh, what was a minor league Sammy Sosa like to see and to broadcast? Uh, you know, I don't think I had him in, in the Texas League, but Sammy was, he joined us on rehab uh, one year. And in fact, a kind of an odd story is we were in Indianapolis at Old Bush Stadium, and Sammy was going to the batting cage, except we had this torrential rain, a big downpour. And I was going back to the clubhouse in the locker room, and somehow we we kind of got trapped together in this little walkway where part of it flooded, so we couldn't go either way. And I I remember that more than anything, just you know having a nice talk for five or ten minutes until I think the rain or whatever subsided, or somehow we got back in the clubhouse. But uh, he was only here for two three games on rehab. But again, he was he was very nice. But I just remember that little conversation we had. And of course, he was just excited to be able to hit again and want to get healthy and go back and help Chicago. And it was all about helping his uh, team up there. I want to ask about your path in the minor leagues too. And, and that stop in the Texas league, because I know that was kind of a leap of faith for you. Um, and I know there are a lot of broadcasters that wonder if that's, you know, you get, you get stuck in one spot and you go, Hey, should I take that jump? Should I take that leap of faith? Um, what was it like? Do you remember the decision process you had to go through to say, you know what, I'm going to upend myself I think you were in your early 30s at that point and moved to Texas to to do this thing that hopefully gives me that shot to get to the next level that I want to reach. Yeah, that was that was the biggest decision that uh, really I had to make in my life. And, and of course, when I say I, that involved at that time, uh, well, my wife and we had, uh, of course, our children are grown now. We're still together, by the way, my wife and I. But uh, uh, that that was a tough one. We had four children that you know we had to move uh my parents were uh older in their late 60s to about 70 at the time and they were only an hour and a half away her parents were were a few more hours away but they also lived in montana we were in helena at the time and and i just thought that i had now i have to do this if i'm all at all serious about this goal of trying to get to the big leagues i've got to do this now to get into baseball full time and and so it was a tough one. You know, minor league baseball, especially at that time, didn't pay too well. And and it was quite a jolt for our family. But uh, the good news is it worked out well. We really enjoyed living in Midland for a couple of years, uh, worked with some nice people down there. Bill Davidson, the Texas League, was, was a fun league. Uh, my wife, through the years, while we were married in her early years, had, had, had done some schooling. And she continued that down in Texas. She'd been a stay-at-home mom until we got to Texas. And financially, she had had to go to work. But uh, she got into work for Texaco down there part-time. And then they hired her full-time. And she kept uh, on the side getting some of her schoolwork done. So she ended up doing pretty well in the insurance business and had a nice career. And, and again, it was a, a tough decision. And maybe looking at it financially, probably one we shouldn't have done. But it, it – worked out okay so uh, yeah it was it was like i said up front it was probably the the toughest decision that uh, i had to make in my life if i can bring it full circle um as you've gone through your entire career the the first question i asked you was about what keeps you coming back game in and game out um but i'm curious how you keep things fresh for yourself as well and obviously the game itself comes um differently every night and the players are different from year to year you mentioned that but how you maybe approach things or how you tweak things or or what you've done differently through the years um that has made each and every night and each and every year a little bit different and a new adventure for you uh that has kept the business fresh for 40 years i think what's really helped me is for a number of years uh well i had always had a partner and a couple of guys eventually getting to the big leagues, Dave Raymond and Brett Dolan, I, I worked with uh, going back probably 15 years or so. And, and uh, so that those two guys, uh, Randy Wayhofer worked with Randy for eight or nine years. And now the, and really 
uh, he's the number one guy now. I'm just kind of the, the part-time guy, do the middle innings and, and try to do color with Alex Cohen, the, the number one guy now for the I-Cubs. But I think that's made a huge difference for me, just to being able to to work with the broadcast partner and, and uh, some of the guys in our league that have been doing it a long time, uh, you know, that pretty much are solo other than maybe having a partner at home. I, I really admire them because uh, – I just think it it makes for a better broadcast. I, I go back to that comment I made about we're competing with the with the big leagues, and you know every big league broadcaster is at least two guys that they have probably more. But if you can, as close as you can come to being a have a big league sound, uh, the better off you're going to be for maybe gaining new listeners or keeping the listeners you have to compete with those major league teams. But uh, for me, that's having a good partner. Where both guys sound good on play-by-play, -play, but also you have that chemistry where you can work well together and talk about the game or, again, maybe talk about some things happening around town or off the field just to, to make it interesting or baseball history. And, of course, with the more eyes you have, the more you'll see just one guy. You're going to miss some things here and there for whatever reason, but if there's a couple of people, then you're going to see more. So for me, that's that's really made a big difference the last 15 years or so is just being able to work with somebody and, and just having a good time uh, with uh, a partnership on the air. Well, and I have to imagine you relished and have relished the opportunity to, to be able to work with some of those younger guys too and, and be a little bit of a mentor for them and, and make that kind of impact in their lives. Yeah, hopefully that's the case. And you'd have to get their opinions, but uh you know, I, I hopefully that's the case where you know it's helped them to to move on and do bigger and better things. And you know, Dave's back in the big leagues now with uh, Texas, and and I think doing pretty well there. And you know, Alex has the ability where I could see him as a big league broadcaster one day. But having said that, uh, it's tougher. It's easier said than done, just because there aren't many jobs that open up up there, and there's so many qualified broadcasters. I think about the guys around our league that are so good in AAA in general and minor league baseball in general, not just AAA, but A ball guys, double A guys anymore are just so good, but it's hard to, hard to move up. And, and I think uh, looking back, I'm just thankful that, you know, I've had 30 years here in, in AAA and these jobs are so precious. And I, I can't forget to, to uh, not mention our organization, just the, uh, Sam Burnaby is the guy that hired me. He's still the, owner or part owner and team president and general manager for the team, the Iowa Cubs. And he's just been really good to me. And, and uh, just working for the organization has helped too, where you're, they kind of let you do your job and, and uh, help you any way they can. And, and there's no pressure about uh, you forgot to do this or that. And, and that's been a, that's been a big part of it too. I think I've been able to, to, to last uh, 30 seasons here in uh, triple a and, and overall I, I have to add them up but i guess it's probably 40 or so that i've, I've been doing minor league baseball and, and, and the first few years more of a part-time deal in helena but yeah 30 32 years total it was kind of the full-time job was uh between double a AA and triple a dean if people want to uh find you on social media or if they want to catch uh, an icubs game um how do they track you down on the internet, uh, iowacubs.com, you can go and, and uh, you know, just navigate through the website to, to listen, which is pretty easy anymore with uh, the internet. That's made a big difference in, in uh, broadcasting, too, in recent years where, man, it's just so cool to be able to have uh, family from, uh, you know, the team's family. I'm speaking of parents and cousins and relatives of the players that get to tune in and follow them or this day and age with even video, MILB.TV, where they can watch and and listen. So that's probably the easiest thing. I'm not a real big guy on, on like Twitter and some of the social media, but, uh, you know, on the, on the website, they can listen in. And I think my email is still listed on there. And, uh, you know, I do have a Twitter handle Dean Ellis, but of course that's another thing I have to overcome is my, the spelling of my names are both <laughs> a little different than what you think. So I think people would try to reach reach out for me and that's where i haven't been real proactive in trying to push my twitter to send me comments or whatnot just because i don't want to 
go go through reminding people how to spell my name because it's not a somewhere there's a it's an easy name to remember Dean Ellis but uh, they're <laughs> both spelled a little different somewhere there's a poor guy D E A N E L L I S who cannot figure out why he keeps getting tweets about the Iowa Cubs he just yeah exactly That's he's exactly just trying right. to be a probably money manager about, in Texas and he can't figure it out <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably about fifty guys like that which. <laughs> Which is fine with me. I learned early on that it was nice to have a different name because they, I think they called my house when I was a teenager trying to collect some money from Dean Ellis and and my mom and dad said, "How do you spell that?" And they, you know, have the correct spelling D E A R the the normal spelling D E A N and E L L I S. And well, no, that's not us. That we spell our name this way. So <laughs> it's uh, I guess made me distinctive at least one way. That uh, Dean lives down the street. All right, that is Dean Ellis joining us here on PXP Cast. Next week, our guest is the voice of the Amarillo Sod Poodles. He's the only one they've ever had. They're like 40 games into the season uh, and their existence. Uh, Sam Levitt will join us. He is one of the uh, most well-known young up-and-coming voices in minor league baseball. But I wanted to talk to him because he's also extremely creative in the way he covers his team Um not just on a nightly broadcast sense, but the, the media around his team. So we'll have an interesting conversation about all of that, and I'm sure we'll talk about his in-game dancing um, <laughs> as well. Sam Levitt joins us next week. Many thanks to Dean Ellis, though, uh, for joining us here on the pod uh, this week. Until next week, we're on a seven-day break. My name's Joel Gadette. The music is Marshmallow, and we are out. And that will do it from St. Louis, where the score is inconclusive.